of a higher and more civil form of justice, capable of repudiating once and for all capital punishment. It involves not only the municipal authorities, but also a humanitarian group, activities, activists, on a city-to-city -city basis. The website puts the Cities for Life on the internet, publishing information about initiatives that are organized by, for the International Day, Cities for Life, Cities Against Death Penalty, as well as being during the course of the year. Thus, the campaign involves local administration on a permanent basis. The Cities for Life campaign spread the appeal for a universal moratorium endorsed by more than 5 million people in 153 countries and present to the United Nations General Secretary on the eve of the historic vote in the UN General Assembly 2007. The number of countries which vote in favor of the moratorium has constantly increased in time. It reached 110 countries in 2012. We hope to see an even large number at the next vote in December 2014. We want to work alongside with many others all over the world to accelerate this international trend so that capital punishment, like slavery and torture, soon becomes a past memory. On this path, we find encouragement in the recent word of Pope Francis. It is impossible to imagine that the state today cannot make use of another means than capital punishment to defend people's lives from an unjust aggressor. All Christians and people of goodwill are thus called today to struggle not only for abolition of the death penalty, whether it be legal or illegal and in, and in all its forms, but also to improve prison condition out of respect for the human dignity of persons deprived of their liberty. We have a dream, no justice without life, no more death penalty. Join us, thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Leo Trangona. Uh, we would like to acknowledge also the presence of our Muslim brothers and sisters who are joining us today. Our next speaker is a man of talent and dynamism. And aside from being a political leader, he is also an a active person in sports and singing. Uh, maybe we can ask him to sing later on. <laughs> he has been a public servant for quite a time as he became the congressman in the lone district of Bacolod before he was elected as the current mayor of Bacolod City. Ladies and gentlemen, Honorable Monico Puentebelia. Magandang umaga sa inyong lahat, sa mga Bisaya, Mayong Aga, sa mga Cebuano, speaking region, Mayong Buntag. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This humble representation stands before you, representing the mayors and the governors in this beautiful Republic of the Philippines. I will be speaking with your indulgence in some parts in Filipino and Tagalog because I want to go straight to the point before the young people of this country. First of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting this humble representation. Maraming salamat. And also to the very distinguished group of uh, resource speakers in the top table, headed by our friend from Indonesia, who I mistook for an Italian yesterday. Uh, he represents Cities for Life, 
representing Santa Egedio. And of course, my Elongo Casimanua from Iloilo, University of Iloilo President, Mr. Herradora. And the other one who has Chinese eyes like me was my very distinguished and very honorable member of Congress whom I had the chance to work with. And I hope someday can follow the footsteps of his great grandfather, the great Senator Lorenzo Tanyada. People whom we miss today in these very turbulent times. I hope my friend Erin can follow the footsteps of his grandfather. And he is one of the few good men that we have today in Congress. And I say that without blinking. The other and the last is from the Department of Justice, Mr. Manico, who loves the mascara of Bacolod, the city of smile. We just finished mascara, and he was one of the thousands of tourists who enjoy dancing in the streets of Bacolod. So kung kayo po may panahon next year, magbook na kayo papuntang mascara. I was invited here representing the governors and mayors but ako po ay naswerte maging nine years sa Kongreso. Nine years na ako ay nag-enjoy. At ako po ay swerte hindi nakasama ng mga mahal ni Napolis. <laughs> kami po ay ni Ering naswerte. Hindi kami type ni Napolis. Ang type ko, Napoleones ng Bakulod. Probably... Some of you are asking, what's so big? What's big about no justice without life? Ako rin, when I was in Congress, bumoto kami, bagsak ang kalaban. It was, it was a landslide. When we were in Congress, when we voted, there was really no excitement. And the voting was really one-sided, Leonardo, in favor of no death penalty. But however, I was surprised when I was lucky to be one of the members of the congressional group that went to Brussels. We visited the European Union. And to my surprise, the topic that we discussed, that everybody was interested in and congratulated the Philippine congressmen and women, was not about education, was not about anti-poverty or corruption. It was about death penalty. They congratulated the congressmen and women for making death penalty down here, prohibited in this country. So I was surprised. I thought it would be anti-corruption, peace and order, and uh, problems in education. No, it was this topic that the members of the European Union asked us. And that was why we were received very well in the European Union. They received us with open arms and congratulated everyone. And then I thought, wow, I'm glad I voted the right way. You know, kasi kamali, nakakaya. So I would like to just tell you that even in Bacolod, we have so many ordinances. Hindi ko na may memorize ang numbers. We do not allow we would not want that penalty in this country. No justice without life. So ako po ay nagpapasalamat sa mga organizers na ako ay pinauna. Sa programa ako po ay nasa huli magsalita. Ako ay pinauna dahil magninong pa ako sa kasal mamaya sa Bacolod. So bago ako mawala ng boto, ako ay lilipad na. Ako ay parang aso na lumabay-labay. Sa Ilonggo yun eh, lumalabay-labay na daw aso. Like Frank Sinatra, I will slowly fade away. So sa inyong lahat, please, kayong mga bata, lalo na, you'll be the future leaders, pagbutihin nyo. Ha? At sana, durugin nyo na yung isyu ng Napolis. Do all your life, put that in your mind. Nagagawin nyo mas mabuting Pilipinas, make it a better place to live in. And no justice without life. Sa aming panahon, at least sa Kongreso, kasama ako, bugbog sarado. 
ang gusto ng death penalty. Kaya ako'y tumatayo rito sa inyo, representing the mayor, the governor, dahil wala sila lahat rito. Ako lang nandito. Ako lang inimbita magsalita. Maraming salamat sa organizer at ako'y nagtataka ba't ako'y inimbita rito. Pero mabuhay ang no justice without life. Happy trip, Leonardo, and God bless. Keep up the good work. Leonardo, keep up the good work. Maraming salamat. Mayong aga sa inyong atanan. Damo ka salamat. Maraming salamat po, Honorable Puente Bellia. Sayang hindi na po namin kayo narinig kumanta. Pasunod na lang. Okay. <laughs> uh, it is indeed an honor to have with us today our former administrator of the Parole and Probation Administration. An advocate of volunteerism, he is instrumental in establishing the National Field Training Laboratory of our agency and in tapping more resources to enhance volunteering efforts and facilitate the rehabilitation of criminal offenders through the help of volunteer probation aides. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Ismael J. Herradura. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Administrator uh, um, Lorna. Uh, Excellencies, fellow advocates of human rights and respect for the dignity of life, friends, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Of course, I salute my co-speakers at the presidential table, especially my good friend, Leonardo, the former congressman from Quezon, and of course, my beloved administrator of the Parole and Probation Administration. My involvement in the Cities for Life project started in 2009 when I participated in the Justice Minister's Conference in Rome, an opportunity which was extended to me by the community of San Egidio through the CBCP, care of Mr. Rudy Diamante, the Executive Director of the Episcopal Commission on Prison Pastoral Care. I know that he was the one who recommended me to Leonardo to join that conference. In that conference in Rome, one significant insight which I gained was the realization that the global campaign for the abolition of death penalty needs everybody's support as we hope to sustain a culture of peace, justice, and love for the entire world. It was not difficult for me to embrace the dictum of no justice without life in view of the fact that as a probation officer for more than three decades, I was deeply immersed in a profession that makes and remakes people a vocation that builds and rebuilds lives through the engagement of supportive, enlightened, and capacitated communities. Thus, when I returned to Manila after that conference in Rome, I shared my learnings with my co-workers in the Parole and Probation Administration, particularly with the middle-level executives. I organized a group that would put into action the Cities for Life project in the national capital region. I was told during that time that ours was a pioneering effort in this regard. To make a very long story very short, we attempted to engage five cities at the NCR for a start. These cities were considered by us because they were the location of some of the correctional institutions and or they had high crime rates or incidents. However, of the five cities targeted, we succeeded in only two, and these were the cities of Manila and Mandaloyong. For some valid reasons, we set aside the engagement of the three other cities. 
I recalled with admiration and gratefulness the effort of the present administrator of PPA, Administrator Manuel Co, because during that time he was my regional director for NCR, and also Director Edith Buemio, who is with the crowd. She was my special assistant during that time, and of course, Dr. Janet Padua, the Chief Probation and Parole Officer of Mandaluyong, she is out there, who was the per who were the persons responsible for helping me out in this initiative. Many of those who work with us are now occupying high positions at PPA, and of course, some of them, like myself, have already retired from the service. At this juncture, please allow me to recall the reaction of the good mayors who responded to our invitation. The former Manila Mayor Alfredo Lim expressed his interest in enrolling Manila as a city for life in view of his belief that the judicial system is not a perfect system. Therefore, the capital punishment could result in the execution of some innocent offenders. On the other hand, the good mayor of Bandaluyong City, Mayor Benhor Abalus Jr., expressed his unqualified support for the cities of life on the basis of the value that he holds for the sanctity of life as he recounted the pain that his family went through when his daughter died. I vividly recall the simple but meaningful programs and ceremonies that highlighted the, en the enrollment process. In both occasions in Manila and Mandaloyong, the staff of the community of San Egidio worked closely with us in a spirit of teamwork. I could remember Ms. Candol, who was very young at the time, delivering her message with passion and ardor, despite the fact that she was new in the position that she was holding. In 2012, two years after my retirement from government service, I had another occasion to help Ms. Candol and the Regional Director of PPA in Region 6, Mrs. Charito Samura, who is right here with us right now, for enlisting the urbanized or the highly urbanized cities of Iloilo and Bacolod in Region 6. In a very short notice, Mayor Jed Patrick Mabilog of Iloilo City facilitated everything that enabled us to declare Iloilo City as a city for life. The same was true for Bacolod City, who during that time was under the, ma the mayorship of Mr. Bing Lunardia, whose support for the City for Life was sustained by his successor, Mayor Monica Fuentebella, who just talked to us a while ago. As partners in these endeavors, the men and women of the Parole and Probation Administration deserve some kind of special recognition for being always ready to help to make things happen. In a nutshell, I would say that this global campaign to abolish the death penalty would succeed if we all together continue to develop and nurture a culture and mindset that plays a supreme value on the sacredness of life, a culture and mindset that make restorative justice not only as a philosophy or framework of discussion, but as a way of living. At this juncture, before I close, and since there are many students who are with us today, I would like to relate an event which happened in Iloilo City last week. In the same university where I am teaching, the, Bo the, the Bureau of Jail Management and Penology and the Parole and Probation Administration program in celebration of the National Correctional Consciousness Week. The format of the program was that of a talk show, and they have this, uh, two, uh, this uh, two personnel from BGMP who acted as uh, moderators. And one of the issues that they tried to raise during the forum was death penalty. And so they asked the panelists, one from the PNP, another from the prosecutor, another from the public attorney's office, 
of course, Director Zamora from PPA, and the Chief of Staff of the GMP, and one from the community, including me. There were two of us from the community. Uh, the other one was a uh, lawmaker, a councillor of Little City. And when the question was raised about our stand on the death penalty, everybody said, we are against death penalty. Now, a very good answer was uh, taken from, was from a, the, the regional state prosecutor who said that before my appointment as regional state prosecutor, I was a human rights lawyer. And so you, have, you don't have to question me about my stand. I am pro-life. And when, during the open forum, the students were asking about the stand of other part, uh, panelists, and everybody said no to death penalty. So I, I am sharing this experience because uh, with so many students around here, and I believe there are many professors or teachers around here, we can always do the same in our respective schools. And I would like to share further that since I am handling a graduate course also at the university, I am handling the course in ethical theory. And one of the uh, ideas that I uh, uh, take up in the classroom is about death penalty, the sacredness of life. And mind you, some of the teachers, maybe this is the first time they hear about discussions on death penalty and about the, tra the tragic situation in our jail system. When I showed to them the movie or the, um, the short uh, movie uh, prepared by UNICEF about Bunso, the situation in the local jail system where the three kids were victimized because of poverty and other uh, social inadequacies. Some of the teachers, teach, these are teachers, or handling high school and elementary uh, classes, some of them shed tears to see how deplorable the situation in jail. Now, in that very, in, in the, I am relating all these things to you because there are, these are small matters, these are small issues, but these are basic in our campaign towards the respect for life. Finally, I believe that this historic event that we are doing right now will mark a significant milestone towards our collective goal of making capital punishment like slavery and witchcraft as memories of the past. Along this line, we look forward to achieve total justice for sustainable development, not only for the Asia-Pacific region, but also for the entire global village. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Ismael Heradura. Our next speaker is a man of integrity and courage. He was twice designated officer in charge of the Bureau of Corrections when problem arises in the Bureau on a concurrent capacity as administrator of the Parole and Probation Administration. It is also during his leadership that efforts towards the establishment of halfway houses to shelter and train former criminal offenders in order to prepare them to re-enter the mainstream of society as low-abiding and productive citizens. Again, let us welcome our administrator, the Honorable Manuel Chico. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Administrator, uh, distinguished guests, uh, especially my fellow speakers in the presidential table, our visitors from the foreign lands who are now in accord with one, the, uh, one purpose, our uh, fellow government uh, employees, non-government uh, organizations, the future of our country, the students, you will be uh, possessing, occupying uh, places, you know, power, authorities later. And then our, uh, our visitors, 
from Bisang Ihidio. And uh, I think uh, one of the uh, sponsors, the main sponsors. No? And uh, baka may nakalimutan pa ako. Okay. Uh, BGNP, Bureau of Corrections, which I formerly uh, uh, headed. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to start with my talk on the, uh, the history of death penalty. In the Philippines, the issue of punishment or capital punishment, whether for or against, uh, is like a game of table tennis where the ping pong ball shatters back and forth. Capital punishment was introduced in the country legal system in 1886 through the old penal code, which was an amended version of the Spanish Codigo Penal of 1870. During the Spanish era, a decapitation through guillotine was used in the case of the martyred priests, especially the students, baka hindi nyo nakilala ito, the Gumbursa. Uh, Father Gomez, Father Burgos, and Father Zamora. And then the Spaniards also used firing squad in the case of Dr. Jose Vizal and other Filipinos who had been killed through firing squad. When the Americans took over the government, they introduced capital punishment through electrocution. The electric chair, the first electric chair, actually there's only one electric chair, which was burned and then repaired. The electric chair was acquired by the New Believed Prison from the United States of America and manufactured by Carr and Scott's Electric Company. It, was, it arrived in Manila on December 17, 1923, on board the SS Elkton, which has a value of 10,080 pesos and 90 centavos. May putal pa. Uh, during the World War II, death by hanging was imposed. Japanese General Tomoyuki Yamashita and 16 others was hung for war crimes. Thereafter, death by electrocutions resumed. All in all, 84 prisoners were executed through electrocution. The last execution was in October 21, 1976. In 1950s, at the height of the Hope Balahaps, I do not know if the student knows this, this is part of the history of the Philippines. Rebellion, the government enacted RA 1700, the anti-subversion law, which was now repealed. Although RA 1700 imposed the death penalty for leaders of rebellion, no execution was carried out under this law. Between 1946 and 1965, 35 convicts were executed, but mainly for particular savage crimes marked by senseless depravity and extreme criminal perversity. From 1971 to 1972, the anti-hijacking law, the Dangerous Drugs Act, and the anti-carnapping law were passed, imposing capital punishment for these crimes. Several presidential decrees were also issued, classifying many crimes as capital offenses, including subversion, illegal possession of firearms, arson, embezzlement, and even illegal fishing. Under the 1987 Constitution, the death penalty was abolished, thereby automatically reducing 57 death penalties to reclusion perpetua. While five were modified to life imprisonment, one for a trial, and six under review. On December 16, 1993, the President approved RA 7659, again restoring the death penalty on certain heinous crime. So lethal injection was again introduced, no longer uh, the death, the electric chair. Finally, RA 9346 of June 24, 2006, again prohibits the imposition of death penalty in the Philippines. So if you would look into the history of uh, our, our country, it's really more on the emotions of our legislatures rather than thinking aloud on what is really moral and proper. When a horrible crime happens in our midst, outpouring of emotional sentiments heightens 
and the clamor for the imposition of death penalty takes the center stage. Long-time arguments for death penalty such as utilitarianism, deterrence, social defense, retribution, among others, resuscitated like hot air. Utilitarianism is anchored on legal rule because of the absolute of the greatest utility for all. It is open at the expense of individual. Utilitarianism is easy to comprehend, but the measure of its utility is quite difficult. This command us to do one's duty, but it does not help us when there are conflicting duties. It can happen that moral questions are decided in different ways under the same ethical system. For instance, when the facts are in dispute, when there is no agreement concerning the accepted facts in a certain case, it is confusing to bring in moral argument before resolving the factual issue, as in the case of social defense versus individual rights to life. Capital punishment is supported by some because of a better belief that it is deterred to people who might commit a heinous crime. Others believe capital punishment is wrong regardless of its deterrence. It is in this that the argument about capital punishment gets confused because it did not really join the issue. Take, for instance, the question, is capital punishment wrong or right? It is different from the question, does, cap does capital punishment deter? So the first can be answered only by moral judgment, while the second can be answered through a study of facts. Practices could be good in one society and maybe bad in another. For instance, if polygamy is necessary, you know polygamy, uh, more than, more than two marriages, because uh, only two is bigamy. If polygamy is necessary to ensure the survival of society, it might be acceptable. But if it was to save the pleasure of some by using or treating others mere objects, it will be immoral. Selling daughters into marriage to enrich the family would never be acceptable because that is not treating them with respect and care. However, arranged mes marriages might be acceptable if all parties agrees and the motives are consistent with care. It is also the same with our gambling in the Philippines. There are legal gambling and there are illegal gambling, but all these are game of chance. It is in this respect that death penalty is likewise treated Killing someone is bad per se. But if the state imposes it, it is legal and acceptable. On a personal account, I can still recall my younger years in government. I was a prison guard in the National Penitentiary, and my, uh, uh, the personnel of the Bureau of Correction could attest to this. I could still recall in my vivid Im imagination the flowing blood oozing from the bodies of prisoners who have been killed in bloody riots. Typically, it was a survival of the fittest. I remember how former Judge Onofre Villaluz, the then circuit criminal court judge, who was known as the hanging judge in the 70s, imposed the death sentences to a lot of prisoners involved in riots. Some prisoners would be dispatched, uh, to, to, to do the ambush, and other prisoners have that the role to surrender and admit the killing. The deterrence of capital punishment did not stop them because the influence of gang leaders and the underworld costs were far stronger than the fear of death penalty. In fact, in the past, my experience as a new guard in the National Penitent Penitentiary Together with another guard, we were assigned in the death chamber to switch on the electric chair. My knees then were trembling and my conscience was bothering me. Before the hour of three in the afternoon, the former strongman, former President Ferdinand Marcos, called up to desist the execution of death sentence for a further review of the case. I was saved by the call. The riots did not stop and death penalty did not deter further violence in the National Penitentiary. It was only the shift in prison policy, 
particularly the granting of conjugal visits, tremendously reduced the number of riots when the prison authorities allowed uh, relatives of prisoners to visit them overnight, stay in. Betting, death sent execution was even an occasion for prisoners or a chance to gamble. Nagsusugal pa rin sila sa loob. Betting whether death execution will push through or the president will declare a, a reprieve to further study the case where the subject of the bet that is nothing for them because they believe that everybody would die and what only mattered for them was who will go first. The issue of reimposition of debt will never solve social issues, but it must be viewed in the context of a system which will truly empower the social institution to institute real reform in the justice system. Bureau of Corrections was modernized by virtue of a law. But the problem now is the budget for the Bureau of Corrections. Hindi pa po dumadating. So again, it's a toothless tiger. The law is a toothless tiger because there is no budget for a, uh, a national prison handling insular prisoners, meaning these are serious offenders. But these are the Bureau of Corrections long time ago as uh, one of the agencies that are neglected. Life of a human being is so precious, and no amount of argument to set aside the right to life. A lot of studies have been conducted about death penalty, whether in the country or outside the country. Various bodies express doubt on the efficacy of capital punishment. In 1969, the report of the former Senator Salvador H. Laurel then chairman of the Senate Committee on Justice on Penal Reforms, made the conclusion that capital punishment is not an effective deterrent. It has no unique, unique deterrent effect which could not be accomplished by imprisonment. A, consider, a considerable proportion of murder and other crimes were committed in the height of sudden passion where offender is oblivious of the death penalty. On the other hand, persons who deliberately plan to avoid detections were not influenced by death penalty. Only persons likely to be deterred is normal, law-abiding citizens who will not commit murder anyway. In conclusion, the report said, detection and apprehension is still the more effective deterrent. The Parole and Probation Administration, an attached agency of the Department of Justice, and the Loan Bureau, which has the mandate to administer the individualized community-based treatment of offenders in the country strongly adheres to the total abolition of death penalty from the statute book. Indeed, it firmly believes on the value of restorative justice as a way to humanize the dispensation of true justice. A vital ingredient in the restorative advocacy is that victims of any wrongdoing must experience and obtain justice not as a means to satisfy the urge for revenge, rather benefit from an adequately addressed situation that is respectful of human dignity and self-worth. No question, the state must punish and convict wrongdoers, but hand in hand, let's stop the culture of crimes and violence, not by a state-sponsored death penalty, but through an alternative treatment that recognizes human rights and human dignity. In its advocacy, the DOJ PPA, as already mentioned by our former administrator, in partnership with the community, the San Ihidio, continuously initiating the struggle to convince local government the dirty hurry of the Philippines. We stood with us through the Cities for Life, and in November 2008, was the first city to enroll. Subsequently, after two great cities, and in subsequent years, the Queen City of Cebu, Cebu City, the city of Talisay, and Lapu-Lapu enrolled in the movement. In Panay Island, Iloilo City and Bacolod City likewise declared their respective position against death penalty. I think through the initiative of the CBCP, Palawan and Bataan, also part of the campaign against uh, uh, death penalty. Article 2, Section 11 of 1987 Constitution explicitly states 
The state values the dignity of every human person and guarantees full respect for human rights. This is anchored on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which the Philippines ratified. No justice without life, because we could not dispense justice to a dead individual. But I say that in the dispensation of justice, there should be love to make this life fully enhanced. Good morning and thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Manuel Ko. We were told that we have mayors present here. Hello po and welcome. And before I call on our next speaker, we would like to inform everyone that we are live streaming worldwide. And we have this link. It's bit.ly slash CSE PH live. So you can call or text your relatives abroad and let them know that you are here so they can watch you on screen. Also, you can upload your photos on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with the hashtag Asia for Life. So, yun po, you can start clicking. Now, <clears throat> Our next speaker was supposed to be our first speaker a while ago, but because Mayor Monico Puentebella had an early flight, we had to call him first. Well, that fact and that because seniority rules. So, having saved the youngest for last, I have the privilege to introduce to you one of the first delegates to attend the meeting of the Ministers of Justice in Rome. He is the former Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives. Ladies and gentlemen, Honorable Lorenzo Erin Tanyada III. I'm on time. So they were checking with me yesterday while I was having my medical checkup. Are you coming? Are you coming? I said, if it's today, I don't think I'll be able to make it. But if it's tomorrow, which is today, then uh, I think I'll be able to come. I first met Leonardo uh, right after we passed the repeal of the death penalty. I was fortunate enough to be invited to attend that uh, conference in Italy. Uh, I was asked by uh, Rudy, Rudy Giamante, who I've met in the struggle to abolish death penalty here in the Philippines. So uh, thank you again for giving me that opportunity. I'd like also to acknowledge, of course, our uh, friends here in the presidential table, Ismael Heradura, and of course, uh, Mr. Manny Ko, and uh, friends from the European Union, Bishop Pabillo is also here, uh, my co-advocate in several issues, freedom of information, Coco Levy. And so uh, I'm happy that uh, there are students who are present today because we all know that the issue of death penalty will always be a revolving issue in countries like the Philippines where justice is low. Just to give a brief background, to add what uh, Mr. Ko had al already mentioned. I would like to thank the community of San Igidio for organizing this activity here in the Philippines with the theme, No Justice Without Life. Having been active in the human rights advocacy since I was in college and in law school, I've been actively campaigning for the abolition of the death penalty as a member of different human rights organizations. When the 1987 Constitution was ratified by the people, I was partly elated with the abolition of, death, of the death penalty. Why partly elated? The constitutional provision that abolished the death penalty provided a situation where it may be 
reimposed. The death penalty was abolished with the adoption of the 1987 Constitution. Article 3, Section 19 states, and I quote, excessive fines shall not be imposed. In 1987, automatically all death penalty cases which were decided by the courts were reduced to life imprisonment. Delation was short-lived. When Congress moved to reimpose the death penalty in December of 1993 with the passage of Republic Act 7659, which uh, identified the capital offenses and the heinous crimes, and another law, Republic Act 8177 in 1996, providing for lethal injection as a means to put to death a person convicted of a capital offense or heinous crime. As a member of a human rights organization called Free Legal Assistance Group, or FLAG, which concentrated its services to people in death row, I was active in the anti-death penalty advocacy for the, for the abolition of death penalty. Flag and I were there actively defending the life of Leo Echagaray in 1999 for those who were already uh, alive by then because I think the students here may not have that much knowledge about that case. He is a rapist who was convicted of raping his daughter. It was in this period that Flag tried all kinds of tactics in order to try to stay the execution of Leo Chagaray. As a matter of fact, we the lawyers who were present, even at the very last minute, submitted petitions to the Supreme Court via fax. No? Via fax. Usually at that time, fax uh, petitions were not were not uh, accepted. You should usually hand deliver or registered mail, but knowing for a fact that, that uh, this would not reach the Supreme Court on time, we were able to send uh, fax petitions to the Supreme Court, which took cognizance of these of this, uh, petitions, but at the end of the day, all, all our motions were denied. The thing really justice, or is it a state? In my first term in 2004, as an elected member of the House of Representatives, one of the first bills I filed was for the repeal of the law that reimposed the death penalty while Congress was deliberating on the repeal of the death penalty. The Supreme Court took cognizance of the moves of Congress and would also issue stay orders with regard to the cases that were already finally uh, decided by the court. As one of the principal authors of Republic Act 9346, which repealed the law that reimposed the death penalty, it is now, of course, a duty and obligation for myself to continue to be vigilant that this law should not be repealed and a death penalty law be reimposed. A lot has been said why death penalty should not be reimposed, and I'm sure all of us know the reason. But again, we can go all back to the question that I asked earlier. Is state-sponsored killing justice? And if we answer this question and say no, then we believe that there is no justice 
without life. Maraming salamat po at magandang umaga po. May I call on Dr. Janet Padua, the Chief Parole and Probation Officer and the Special Assistant to the Administration of the Parole and Probation Administration Office. Okay, uh, dearest participants, did you enjoy the uh, panelist discussion and lecture? Did you enjoy, my dear students? Oh, you're very important today. Why? As for your information, uh, I just wanted you to read um, some uh, short history of Santa Gedio. In 1968, the community of Santa Gedio was established as a faith-based organization by high school students. For your information, and to fully pursue peace and solidarity. So the rest is history. Now it happened. So, I, so after hearing excellent words of wisdom from our honorable um, panelists, and get, I am indeed sure that our ideas regarding the raise your right hand if you do want to um, ask questions and identify yourself. Good morning. I'm Narisa Lusaria from the Department of Education, Mandaluyong City. Uh, human rights education has been in our curriculum and uh, we have uh, learning competencies to teach about uh, human rights and the value and respect for the dignity of life. My question is, while we know that uh, it is not a deterrent to committing serious crimes or heinous crimes, this uh, death penalty, how do we address those who continuously violate the rights of people by committing the, these crimes? What government interventions do we have to continuously uphold and respect the dignity of life? So anybody from the panelists can answer the question. Kindly give microphone to you. One microphone to you. Uh, thank you for the question. No? Uh, the way I'd look at it, uh, we would f have to address the issue of poverty. Because poverty is one of the prime movers on why people commit crime. No? So you have, to issue, uh, you have to address the issue of poverty. The other issue that you have to address also is the prevalence of drugs. Now, if you address the student, then uh, I think you can start to, uh, start to minimize the, issue, uh, the prevalence of crime in society. So it's more of the social issues that governments or local governments should always look at in solving or trying to deter crime. Okay, thank you very much. Any addendum, sir? Yeah, addendum. Uh, you know, the problem of death penalty, actually, it's not really the issue. No? Uh, one of the, uh, a lot, always the part of the discussions, and even studies co uh, conducted before, uh, death penalty is not a deterrent. But what is important is we should strengthen first the basic institution which is the family. Yun ang pinaka-importante. The family is the basic institution. We start from that nucleus. And then start again uh, with the criminal justice system. Kung titignan nyo, para napakalaki, no? Napakalaki, no? But basically, the problem is in the family. There is a problem in the family that we have really to address. It will follow later those problems in the criminal justice system Kasi sabihin po natin, they are still part of the, cream, of the family. Kaya po, we have really to strengthen the family is a basic social institution. Uh, take for instance the Bureau of Corrections, uh, which I, uh, I was an officer in charge before. Uh, the problem of Bureau of Corrections, we have now a, uh, a law which modernized the Bureau of Corrections. The problem now is the budget of the Bureau of Corrections. Despite that, they are at, now at par with the other correctional agencies. Ang problem po ay budget. Kaya sabi ko nga, kawawa ang Bureau of Correction part, needs further corrections. But again, uh, these issues on the 
yung ating pong mga riding in tandem, all this, the Abu Sayyaf, the problem in the South, these are basically a, uh, an issue in the family that we have really to address. Kaya very, very important is the role of the churches, the role of, the role of our civic organizations, our civil societies, our non-government organizations. Uh, basically, we have the five pillars of the criminal justice system. The four pillars of the criminal justice system provide legal leaderships. But the community pillar, which should also be part of the criminal justice system, sabi nga, ito po yung pinaka maliit, no? which represent the small finger. Sabi nga, sakit ng kalingkingan, sakit ng buong katawan. We have really to strengthen the community as a basic institution but not to sacrifice the life of a human being. Marami pong problema ang society. Weak imprisonment, which imprisonment could deter. So I think, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Administrator Ko. So, do we have any questions from the ground? Identify yourself. Good morning, everyone. I am Michael Angelo B. Manalo from Third Year Accountancy Student in Rizal Technological University. I have specifically two questions. One is the general definition of the death penalty, and specifically, in especially everyone who saw in the news about the rampant increase in the crimes committed, especially heinous crimes. Well, some advocates have to choose the reimposition of the death penalty. The, the question now is, why did some of the pro-death penalty groups have continued to advocate the reimposition of this penalty as opposed to many of us are opposing to them? What? So, from the group. So the, uh, the Let query, me elaborate this. Let can me kindly elaborate. clarify your question, yes. one short. So, what okay. is the... The question, I think, is why, is why is it that the advocates in favor of the uh, yeah. abolition continue to um, push that, the other way around? Yes. Why is it that there are people who advocate for the reimposition of the death penalty? Okay. okay. Uh, well, perhaps it is because they feel that, that is this, this is the only way to solve the problem. This is what we call... Uh, knee-jerk impulse. Parabang uh, they do not reflect so much on the reason behind why people keep on doing things in spite of the fact that there is already this um, harsh penalty. Well, as uh, the speaker since yesterday was saying that history is replete with information that despite the severity of penalty, punishment from times immemorial people continue to commit crimes. Why? Because of uh, there are theorists which say that crime is a phenomenon which even the offenders themselves could not understand why such a thing is happening in them. So that is why when the parole and probation administration, the, par the probation program was introduced in the Philippines, the big argument is there is a disease that is happening within the offender. And because there is a disease or a malfunctioning, that offender needs treatment. So that is why uh, what we are doing right now is we are studying the case very thoroughly. We look into the background. We look into the childhood experiences. And we make some treatment plans which are individualized and responsive to the needs of the offender. Now, uh, I am teaching... Uh, institutional corrections and non-institutional corrections. So we have, uh, before we handle the, uh, the real meat of the course of the subject matter, we look into the history. Uh, before, a very terrible, terrible yung kanilang penalty because there is disemboweling, there is the killing the person or skinning the person alive. Now, despite this approaches to punishment, nothing happened. So, uh, again, we would like to emphasize that, sabi ni uh, uh, Administrator Ko, the family is responsible. I, I believe so. 
and the school system is all responsible? I believe so, because there are even teachers who cannot walk the talk that they are teaching their students. So this is a reflection of the kind of society that we are in. So we have to make a very good reflection, re-examine ourselves from children to parents, everybody. That's my answer. Thank you. Okay. So please, uh, may we call other students, please? Uh, next, we will give you a chance can I, after one question. From, yes? Can I uh, Yes, so sorry. So, well, yes? Uh, one of the reasons why the people also are continue to advocate the death penalty is because they know that right now the system of justice does not seem to address the situation properly. There's no certainty that a person will be arrested. There's no certainty that the person will be convicted. So if that is the case, then uh, like uh, the professor said, the best way is already to immediately just kill that person. Now, the important thing here is to make sure that our system of justice works properly. No? And problema, even that guarantee no, is, is, is still a dream for all of us. You can just imagine what an alleged accused have to go through when they go into court especially if they do not even have a lawyer of their choice because of lack of funds. So they will rely now on the public attorney's office. And we have to salute the public attorney's office for the work they're doing despite of the caseload that they have. Isang public attorney's office sa isang branch, aabot ng limang daan, 500 cases. How can he concentrate on a case that involves a uh, heinous crime if that person is actually innocent of the crime. So, so this is why we feel that unless there is a certainty of arrest, unless the fear of conviction is there in the minds of, uh, of a person who commits crime, then uh, crime will continue. And it is not a solution that we impose death penalty. Thank you very much, Honorable Tenyada. Additional um, answer from Mr. Leonardo. Let me say thank you for this question because this is the, the, the point. We think and we agree that the death penalty is not the deterrence. We explain that the... the Sometimes the problem of the death penalty is the way sometimes to solve the problem immediately. Sometimes the people always think that the penalty is, we have a problem, we solve the problem with the death penalty immediately, to erase the problem. Sometimes we are not ready to face the problem. Yes, I totally agree, because we need to avoid the violence, to avoid the death penalty. First of all, we are here to build a culture, a new culture, a new culture of mercy, a new culture of compassion. Why we say cities for life? I think this is the answer. Cities for life is the big movement who involve the whole society for a dialogue, not to impose, for a dialogue to know each other. This is the answer of our community all over the world. Our answer is to be together, to dialogue, to know each other. In terms we study, it means we are here to know you. And I think it's very important because the most important thing, how to avoid, we need to build something new.